Hi everyone, this is Mahabeli from the American University in Cairo. And today we're gonna to be talking about alternative approaches to grading. And this seems like it doesn't connect to community building, but I think it really does because it's how you relate to your students and the sort of reciprocity that you have with your students and sometimes them with each other because grading can be something that is competitive that actually goes against community building. And I think these alternative approaches to grading, if you can find a way to make them work in your institution, <laughs> would be uh, something to, worth considering, especially with the pandemic, especially with institutions that are not allowing uh, pass-fail type of things, but you still want to sort of be kind to students and to focus on their learning and not these numbers that represent, I mean, each of the people here can also talk about why they went uh, ahead and did this instead of uh, regular grading. So today, the person who inspired this conversation is Arlie Crothers. Um, we also have Laura Gibbs, Rissa Torrenson Unru. Mia Zamora, Jasmina Najor, and Jonathan Forbes. I hope I've said everyone's name right, but when it's your turn, you can tell me if I've said it wrong. So Arlie, take it away. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, um, today. It's always exciting to get to talk about this, uh, um, this topic here. Um, so I will, I'll just talk briefly about my, I'm trying to figure out a way to share my, my whole screen here. Um, but uh, let me just give you the, uh, there we go. I think we've got them all. Um, so my sort of approach, I've tried uh, different types of ungrading and I, I first got into ungrading because I teach at, I teach applied communication, so basically business communication. And I teach it um, at a university with um, a lot of international students. So I have students who are taking classes in the English language for the first time, um, are new to the, the Canadian school system and just a real range of, of, um, of students. And what I was finding was that students would, um, you know, sometimes in the first assignment, they would be really enthusiastic at the beginning of the semester, really excited to get going. And then at the first assignment, maybe they would uh, misread the, the assignment prompt or they've never actually done um, an assignment because they come from an educational system that doesn't do those types of assignments um, and end up getting a, uh, a grade that they're not happy with. And even though I've always allowed revisions, what I was finding is that that student was just shut down and withdraw. And so I wanted to go with ungrading as a way to kind of flip that dynamic and also really focus on, um, because I teach business communication, focus on the type of feedback that they were going to get in the workplace. You know, you never, nobody in the workplace is ever like, here's a B minus, okay, it's done. Um, so I wanted to sort of mirror that, that process. So this is the first semester. Um, I've tried things like um, I do, I, I used to do when I taught face-to-face, -face, a great, this sort of great big report project where students work together to create this um, 100 to 150 page report. They do all this research, but nobody gets a grade on it. They get graded on a performance evaluation where they basically describe their contribution to the project. Um, and that worked pretty well. It's the class wasn't fully ungraded, but it had kind of ungraded elements. Um, but I decided uh, this semester after reading um, uh, Dr. Asao Inoue's uh, anti-racist writing um, assessment ecologies that I wanted to go full in with contract grading because I think it, would, it will help um, even out some of the, uh, the, the barriers that I was, I was still seeing. And so to help students, I've always found that when I've used ungrading, um, students are a bit suspicious of it. It's very different from what they found before. And so I have to do a lot of work to, you know, reassure them that like, this is not a trick that I'm, uh, you know, uh, here to kind of walk them through the process. Um, and I think it's a little bit harder when it's um, online and this one particular course, which is a pathway course for students who are upgrading their skills. Um, to get into our university um, is not one that had really ever been offered online before the pandemic. It's not really well, you know, um, uh, a lot of the students didn't want to be online. And so because I couldn't really talk about it face to face with them, I have decided to try to make the information about that contract grading in as many formats as possible. So the first thing I did was make an Instagram style sort of billboard that describes, you know, here's what contract grading is. Here's Arlie, can grade. you maximize can you maximize this window because the other one in the background is showing up as well so we okay let me see if i things. can uh, there we go oh yeah thank uh, you that um 
Yeah. So basically here's what contract grading is and then laying out the contract so they could just see, here's what I have to do to get a B. Um, and then if I want to get higher, if I want to get more than a B, here are the tasks that I can do. And the thing I really like about this uh, is that um, it allows students many pathways through the course. So if you want to come up with your own assignment, you know, you can, you can do that. And I also, there's, they're going to be doing a reflection at the end of the semester. And so they can also um, make the argument if they ran into some, you know, some barriers, maybe they missed an assignment that they had positively impacted the, a classmate or done something else outside of the class that really wasn't captured in the stuff that they handed in. Uh, and I've done this in the past and be really surprised. Like I had one semester, a student um, was a music producer and he as he had made beats for all of the other students' videos. And I had no idea that he had done that. I um, was just like, wow, the music is really great on all of these, uh, you know, these videos. So um, just as a way to show that uh, a lot of times I have um, students who come in really with a, a, a sort of adversarial relationship to writing, feeling like I'm not a good writer. I don't like writing. I don't especially like business writing and just a way to show that there's a lot of different ways to be successful in this course. And then it also lays out what happens if you know you uh, um, miss an assignment or if you don't uh, complete the participation activities or um, you know if you don't complete uh, uh, these I have these lessons that sort of wrap up both the readings and the um, these sort of reflection activities. Um, but an infographic isn't accessible to everyone because I, uh, you know, have students who use screen readers, etc. So I've tried to um, put this in multiple formats. And so I've tried to, um, uh, I've created a video. I won't show the video because it's, you know, nothing special, but I've also got a transcript to the video. And then I also have um, in my syllabus here, my, my course presentation, um, the same information. So you can get the information in the infographic, you can get the information in the text if you use a screen reader, you can get the information in the video that's captioned, or you can get it in a transcript of that video. So you have a bunch of different ways to access the, the information um, depending on your needs. Arlie, you also have those personas. Can you show them like where, how someone ended up with an A and how someone ended up with a B? It was yeah. in the infographics. Can we yeah, show that as well? Show. Let me pull We're going to link up. everything in the resources, but yeah, so the, uh, you know, this is also my kind of what we're doing and why to, to give them a bit more of a, um, an orientation, but yeah, so I also sort of created these, these personas um, of uh, examples so that they could see this in, in, in practice. So, um, you know, using names of, of past students and kind of laying out a pathway. So this student missed a conference. He's now got a B minus. He completed a bonus assignment and ends up with an A minus. So they can see that it's not just like once you, if you go down in a grade, you're not there for, you know, forever. You can, you can go back up. I also noticed like the, the diversity in the names that you've chosen and just the, how much care you took with these is really inspiring. And I think that's why so many people are retweeting them because so much thought into this. Thank you for doing it and sharing. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, I teach a really diverse student population and even with my open textbook, um, I really have tried hard to uh, make it reflect the, the students in my class. So the names of the students in my class, the pictures of, of uh, students in my class so that, and I found that students have actually picked up on that, which is, which is interesting to see. Okay, was there something else you wanted to show before I interrupted you? Sorry. No, that's, uh, yeah, that was just sort of an overview of um, some of the, the infographics. I created, a, I think I created 12 in total, um, but, you know, that's, those were sort of the ones that focused on, on grading. Laura, do you want to go? Yeah, this is great to be able to follow up on Arlie's because I use a, a very similar kind of contract system, um, but I use micro assignments with it. So it's in a sense simpler than what Arlie is doing. And that works really well online. My courses have been online for a gazillion years and I developed my own grading when I was teaching online. So it's kind of a, a synthesis of the possibilities. And I've got all my stuff at grading.mythfolklore.net. Um, so I've written a lot about what I do in the hopes that some of it or all of it uh, can be useful to others. And please, anybody who's out there, 
uh, feel free to contact me at Twitter um, and email, whatever, uh, however you want to talk about this, because I'm glad to share what I've learned. Um, my classes are gen ed classes with a wide range of students. And that's the kind of flexibility I think that was really important for me because in a gen ed class, it might be a class that's really meaningful and important to some students, but not that meaningful and important to others. And so I was just prepared for the idea that students are going to want to do the minimum, right? And that's fine. If the class is not important for them, well, I need to say what the minimum is. And the way I think about that is, what is the minimum in terms of passing the class? Like, I would love it if the class were just pass, not pass, because then I could say, here's what this class is for. You did that thing. You've done the class. You have passed. You have accomplished this stuff. And the kind of stuff we do is learning how to blog, learning how to publish a website, writing stories, learning how to give feedback to others, learning how to revise your stories based on feedback. It's not complicated. But my school requires me to give letter grades. And I, I just hate that, right? Because the ABC is not about saying you did the class, you passed, hooray. The ABC is about rating people with no standards and also about ranking people against each other, right? The only thing you can say with certainty about an A as opposed to a B is that an A is better than a B. I have no interest in that at all. And so I set up a points-based system so that for all the little micro assignments that students are doing in the class, they go into the LMS, into the grade book, and as they complete each assignment, they uh, affirm with a true answer in a true false quiz question to having completed the assignment based on totally objective criteria, right? So it's not any of this angstful, like, how well did I do? It's just like, did I finish that thing that I was supposed to do? And if you did, you say true, and then that's the correct answer to the question and the points go into the grade book. So I have nothing to do with any of that, right? The students are doing usually five or six or sometimes more of these uh, small assignments each week and they're recording those points in the grade book and they see their total points. If they wanna get an A as opposed to a B or a C, there's a threshold for those points. Uh, like Arlie was saying, you do more work, you get a higher grade. Totally arbitrary cut points, right? They mean nothing, but that's true for all grading, right? Why is 90 and above an A? No one knows. So the students are busy doing that, and I don't even watch those points, right? I just keep track each week. I go into the the grade book and I look at the lowest point totals for the students, like you can sort the grade book by points. And so I just flip it. And my class is big enough that I don't even see all the students on the screen, right? I just see the students who have the lowest number of points. And I look for anybody who's at risk of not passing the class because that would be very bad, right? You don't want to fail the class because you paid all this money, you spent all this time, you don't want to fail the class. And so I keep an eye on the students who have a low number of points. And, you know, each of those students has a story, right? And I pretty soon find out what their story is. Either they're really bored in the class, in which case I that's good, right? Boredom is good. I can work with that. I can try to help them find different things to do because the class is super flexible that way. But they may be dealing with other problems where it's a lot harder for me to help them with those problems, uh, like during the pandemic, especially students losing their jobs, losing their housing, health issues that they have, their family has. You know, so every student has a story and I try to learn what those particular student stories are and work with them however I can. And my goal is always just for everybody to pass the class and they do. And that makes me very happy. And I have no idea who's getting an A or B or C. I just find that out on the, when the class is over, I go in and sort the grade book the other way and copy out who got an A, who got a B, who got a C. So for me, this approach has worked great because I'm not involved in the grading at all. I'm just there every week giving students feedback on their work. And that's what they really need, right? That's what they really want. That's what's really useful. Grades aren't useful. And so I sometimes call the approach um, all feedback, no grades, because I don't put grades on anything. And I guess that's the main message I'd like people to be able to take away from this is that institutionally, you're probably going to be required to give grades, right? Some kind of A, B, C, D, F, or whatever the system is in your country. And you can do that in a way that satisfies the institution's needs 
while not having it sabotage the teaching and learning that's going on in your class. You're going to have to experiment probably to find ways to do that, but there are so many possibilities. So I've used this points-based system. There's some advantages, disadvantages to that, but if you teach online, this points-based system is great because there's no conferencing. A lot of the uh, ungrading systems do involve one-on-one -on -one conferencing with students. I, I don't do that. Um, but at the same time, I think this, this offers a lot of the same advantages for building in self-reflection, self-monitoring, self-affirmation for the students. So um, I could talk forever about this. I'll go ahead and stop now. But anybody who has questions, I'm easy to find at Twitter. I'm at online CRS lady, online course lady. And I'm always glad to to talk about ungrading with anybody because I think it's incredibly important. I can't imagine teaching without it. And um, like I said, I'm glad to help. Okay, excellent. I guess I'm next. So I'm gonna, not gonna make Maha tell me I'm next. I'm just gonna do it. I'm at uh, <laughs> Central New Mexico Community College in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I'm also a PhD student in learning sciences. And in fact, ungrading is going to be part of what I'll study for my dissertation research. And so I'm really interested in like what the constructs are of ungrading and what really undermines ungrading in terms of um, constraints and context. Um, because what y'all are talking about is awesome. And I love the fact that it works in your class and I can't do that. Um, because I'm from a STEM field and not that STEM is that different, but that I teach chemistry, I teach organic chemistry um, and general chemistry. And my students come in not only expecting a grade, but if I undermine their um, assumption that they're going to get a grade, that suddenly puts their whole goal structure of I'm going to get into pre-med in some disarray. And so it becomes even more of a struggle of um, we really need to build trust with one another. So there's a lot of agency. There's a lot of different pieces to my class. Some of it is regular grading. Um, the online homework just automatically grades itself. And I do that to give them something um, that they can kind of hold on to. Um, and then there's some binary grading. There's also in the exams, the conversation, because the exams take up the largest percentage of their grade. And that's where I really felt like the conversation needed to happen. Um, so I came to this uh, because I felt it was a social justice issue. What I found is that it is, um, I would love to self-assess. I would love to teach my students how to be better in terms of self-assessment, like how to, how to build that skill and how to really understand how to do that better, how to be better in terms of knowing what they know and what they don't know in terms of metacognition. Um, but what I find is when I do it at the beginning, um, if you have uh, certain aspects, not aspects, um, the more oppressed, uh, the more you fit into oppressed groups in organic chemistry. So the number of oppressed groups compounds your ability to self-assess yourself. And so I almost always have folks who will rate themselves two or three lettered grades lower than I would have, which makes it essential for me to still have to teach, I mean, still have to grade. And I have to still do that to some degree to help people from undermining their own learning and their own rating of themselves. Um, and so that becomes a really problematic moment. And, and there's... I have all of my stuff. I've written a lot about this in terms of uh, ungrading my process. It, my process evolves all the time. I see it as a giant experiment in my class and it's very freeing creatively um, and very awesome in many ways. And it still is hard um, because if I adopted Laura's system, for instance, I would have people who consistently underrate themselves and get a C in my class simply because they don't think they're putting in the work that everyone else is when they're actually putting in more work than everyone else is. Um, and so I don't know how to get around that exactly, other than assessing them and saying, no, actually you're, you're doing great. Let's try to get you closer to, to where 
you're actually understanding what you know and what you don't know based off of, you know, what the work is for the rest of the class. Um, and that's, that's kind of where I am right now. I'm stuck in that space as a STEM instructor, um, mm -hmm. trying to change the community building so that we're in a learning community together, build that more so that they can talk to one another. I spend more time giving them agency, a lot of choose your own adventure assignments of like, please, you know, figure out which one you want to do and, and we'll call it good. Some good binary grading, like do it, we'll call it good. Completion grading is what you could also talk it, right? Talk about it as, but um, this yeah. is a struggle. And I find it particularly with um, native women and um, LGBTQ um, of a minority in terms of race as well. And those are the two groups that really struggle to give themselves any kind of moment of, yes, I did this well. And, and probably because it's years of telling, being told they aren't doing it well, right? How do you get past that? Um, other than just gently being like, no, really, I think you're doing a fantastic job. Let's keep on keeping on. Um, that is, that's where I'm struggling right now. So I'm sorry to just bring up the issues. I love no, on grading. I wouldn't change it for the world, because... but. This is huge because you're coming at it from a social justice angle and the most vulnerable students are still the ones who are still not benefiting the most from it. But what you're saying is also a bigger issue beyond your class because they're probably undermining themselves when they apply, if they, they may not even apply for jobs that they deserve, they may not apply. These are co community college students, so they could go on right. to full university. Right. They may not think they're good enough to do that. They may not ever right. apply for PhD programs or even if they write have you seen people who sometimes write letters, cover letters, and they undermine themselves in those? Yes. Those are, those yes. are, this is hard work. I, I work with a lot of my um, colleagues who are younger than me about how do you present yourself to the world and people feel bad about showing off, but they also really believe they're not that good. And so there's, right. hopefully they're getting something from the affirmation that you're giving them. And right. they're still learning that. It's what I worry about is like, how many risks are they gonna encounter in their lives? So that right. they internalize that message and it un they unlearn the other message. Right. And my thing is like, I would love to give them all A's. And I tell them, I would love to give them all A's. And almost all of them always say to me, you're the first chemistry teacher I've ever met who would say that. Yeah. So Jasmina, I think she wants me to say what she's written here. And then others had comments as well. Uh, Jasmina was saying, and she's at the American University of Beirut. She teaches writing. And when I tried on grade, she's saying, when I tried on grading, I had a rubric for each little assignment so students could grade themselves. And I then shared a great assignment example. And even then there were issues with self-assessment. Um, yeah, so that's what Jasmina was saying. And I know Laura and Arlie were saying things. Um, so if you guys want to say them out loud, just because people will be able to see the chat and the video. Um, and then Mia can talk to us about how she does thinking. Yeah, I'll just chime in that completion-based grading has worked really well for me. So, you know, like students get feedback on all aspects of their writing from me person to person, but in terms of the grading activity, it's based on completion and they can feel really confident that they have completed the assignment, like Rissa was saying, and they check things off and it's good stuff, right? They're, they're publishing stuff online, usually for the first time ever. So they're proud of that. They check it off, they get their points. And it's very affirming because as writers, they are so unconfident. So I'm really glad that my grading system is affirming for them in a concrete, objective, shareable way. Look, see what I did. Um, so that's been really important for me. No rubrics, just checklists. Yeah, my thing about completion-based grading, which is an awesome moment, and I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but for me as a chemistry instructor, there's an underlying assumption of, a, of making your best effort I've had a lot of people just like do one cent, like you're expecting a paragraph. You're like, here's what we're gonna talk about. A minimum of 400 words, they write one sentence, right? So then what does that mean? And that can be in a visual way, like with a reaction or it could be in a writing way. So what does completion mean? What does giving your best effort or a good faith effort mean because that's the underlying assumption of all of this is that if you're going to do a completion grade you're going to try and learn in the midst of this mm -hmm. so what does that mean 
I'm, I'm a shameless counter of words. I'll just say that I do have word counts on not all assignments, but on a lot of them. And that's what's been great about this 100 word experiment that we've started this year is, is, is thinking about, you know, how do word counts help you? How do minimums, how do boundaries help you move forward? You complete one thing, you go on to the next, but to go on to the next, you have to complete the first thing. And so I, I used to sort of feel apologetic about word counts, but I don't anymore. And I do rely on them a lot. I think that one thing that I have um, found is that I spend the first two weeks of the semester explicitly talking about unlearning and explicitly talking about what values and assumptions we bring to both the classroom and also the idea of writing. Because one of the things I found is that there is that piece where some students will say, you know, I, uh, my family and my culture has taught me to value humility. I can't say I deserve an A plus. Like that's that's not a thing that I can. Um, that I can say, um, or students saying, I'm not a good writer. Like I put the label as not a good writer on myself and uh, I'm just gonna see everything through that lens. So um, one of my first assignments is sort of thinking through, is there anything in this class you want to try to unlearn? Is there anything, um, you know, when we're talking about, I try to talk about the, the kind of power structure of the university. So it works out really well that because I teach business communication, we're talking about kind of context and audience and audience analysis. And one of the things we start off about is thinking about what are the spoken assumptions of the university and what are the unspoken assumptions and sort of how did you, you learn that? Um, and talking about, for example, like I use the example of how uh, CEOs send very, very short emails. So why do CEOs send very short emails? You know, why can a white male CEO send you an email that says, okay, cool. And uh, someone who's new or uh, racialized or starting out can't do that. So, um, you know, I have found some success in talking explicitly about some of these issues. And I feel like I always learn something as well. Um, but yeah, my hope is with contract grading that it'll take out that piece of students feeling like I'm not good enough. That uh, when I I set up the, the criteria so that it's pretty minimal, but it still shows that they've achieved the learning outcome. So, you know, for example, you have to, in this assignment, you have to answer the three questions. You have to have used an email format. You have to have, if you use the source, you have to cite it. And that's it. You can make mistakes in that and you can, you're going to get feedback and you're going to be revising it. But um, that way they have an idea of, okay, here are the three. These are the, if you can say you did these three things, then, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to get the points. I do worry a little bit that some people, especially the kinds that uh, Rissa was talking about, would think, OK, I'll just strive for the B and not try harder. Um, and we can come back to that in a, in a second. But Jasmina has been saying things in the chat that I, she wants me to read out loud. So Jasmina was saying when she tried ungrading, her students hated it. And she said that she and I had a conversation about this and the cultural issues in the Middle East and North Africa region where I think students are I think it's the same everywhere, honestly, but it might be even harder here that they're just used to someone else being the authority figure, telling them what numbers they deserve. Numbers are so important. Um, I don't know what it's like in Lebanon, where Jasmina is, but in Egypt, like in the, the high school degree thing, they count things. There's no ABC. There's actually numbers. And people can get things like 110%. Yeah, it's really weird. I'm not exactly sure how they do that. I think they get I guess 100% on the academic stuff somehow. Like, can you imagine high school getting 100% on everything? And then they do, I don't know, extra artwork, extra language levels, extra sports or whatever, and they get more. I'm really not sure how they get a lot more than that. But then when they do other degrees, like, anyway, never mind. The, the numbering thing is just horrendous over here. And Jasmina's saying that contract grading has been working well for her so far. No more rubrics, no more need to have comments justifying the grade, just feedback that actually helps learning. And so this reminds me a little bit of what Laura was talking about, you know, no numbers, just feedback. Um, I think, and then Jasmina's also saying the freedom for students to choose their grade based on their effort, it rewards honest effort. Um, I think Mia was trying to say something, right? Go ahead. Yes, I, I'm, I'm just, Thinking and listening to everything everybody's saying, I want to echo, first of all, that I think the values of unlearning, um, also metacognition in self-assessment, um, and then certainly this being a social justice issue, I wanted to foreground how significant all of those comments were, for me at least, in this practice. I've got, come about this a variety of ways in um, a length of time. Um, so I've sort of tinkered with 
ungrading and contract grading for years now. I just want to share a few things that I've done that I think are, um, that uh, I haven't heard much about in our conversation thus far, but I think were worth um, sharing. The first one is that in the process of developing the contract, I've opened it up to student collaboration. So in essence, it's not me giving the contract, it's us developing the contract together in the beginning. I think it would be important just to follow on the heels of what Arlie said earlier, that that conversation about unlearning and power dynamics and just institutionally and understanding what learning is authentically versus the way it's evaluated and then uh, ranked and marked, that that conversation has to, be, has to happen first but then to invite them in to a collaborative design of that contract is a very powerful moment. So I've done that. And what I've done is basically offered a kind of bones or template of what could be the contract and then invited them into a collaborative writing document where we worked it out or they talked it out and, and talked about what they wanted to emphasize more or wanted to emphasize less in terms of their overall understanding of learning in the experience. So that was one thing I wanted to share. Um, another thing I wanted to share is that I find my students who are writing and literature students um, and most of them at the graduate level, so it's a very different context than some of my colleagues here have described. Um, for this set of students, they're very responsive to research around the issue of unlearning and ungrading. So I always share with them, for example, um, Jesse Stommel's article on how to unlearn or how to, uh, excuse me, how to ungrade, um, because I think that sets up a conversation that's rather radical for them that they haven't heard of yet, but it's also scholarship. It's not just one radical professor trying something unheard of. Um, before. So I think there gives it a certain kind of validation in thinking about what freedom in learning and empowerment in learning is to see a research based orientation towards this practice. And then um, is just one thing I want to make research a, based. Well, I mean, in hybrid pedagogy, that article that he wrote about how to ungrade is okay. an orientation around scholarly engagement with that versus just someone randomly talking, I'm going to do this. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> um, and then finally, I wanted to say that um, I wanted to make a comment about the self-sabotaging in self-assessment and talk about the fact that um, being able to assess oneself in an authentic way to me is a really critical skill, just as you've all said so far. And so I emphasize um, the self-assessment narrative that they have to generate at the end of the course. What that basically is, is a one to, page, one to two page story they're telling about the experience uh, that they've had in this course and what they believe they've learned, what things they didn't expect, surprises that came along the way, what kind of skills they might've gained that aren't skills that are apparently part of the journey in the beginning, like skills that aren't academic necessarily, but important life skills. I ask them to um, articulate all of that at the end. And then I ask them to offer up their understanding of their grade at that stage as well. And uh, what I've seen is just what you have all said consistently over time, which is an undermining of the self in a variety of different student profiles that have to do with race, with gender, with sexual uh, orientation. It is almost um, predictable on some level. And I always say I reserve the right to tinker with the nuance of that, the subtlety, like a slight difference in the grade based on what I see. And it has always been my practice that, um, to up the grade of those who undermine themselves. So they usually are shocked at the end, but the, the, there's typically certain students always undercut themselves. And so I say in the fine print, I reserve the right to make a shift or change if I perceive that there is a distinction. I mean, there's a distinction between I see, what I see is their um, inherent and authentic learning versus the way they've assessed themselves. Um, so yeah, those are just my like um, uh, additions to everything that everyone's saying that's so thoughtful and um, helpful to everyone else. Marissa, you were saying something about those narratives. Uh, how do you do them? You do them slightly differently? So I do them, um, 
I do them as exam growth uh, moments, uh, like assignments uh, after each exam. So they can track their progress through the exam. And then at the end of the semester, they have a choose your own adventure moment where they could do a take home final or they can write a narrative about their learning and how it intersects with the pandemic and what that looked like so that they can really talk about what their own context was and what they brought to the table in that. And it is, um, it's a lot to read those. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of hurt and pain going on during this pandemic and it's not small, but I feel like the exam growth moment at least gives us a sense of like, how did you feel about this exam? It, it gets for me a little more metacognitive of like, let's analyze what you were doing here um, it, during this time, as opposed to over the whole course. Cause I feel like for my students that can't do, <laughs> they need more chunks, <laughs> but they're lower level students. Right, I have I have one first first two years. That's mm -hmm. the max I can teach. So, um, if I was talking about a graduate student, which I think on grading should be part of all graduate work, like that's a whole different deal. Yeah, but the metacognitive aspect is so important, especially with the pandemic, where everyone's cognitive function is probably a little bit impaired by the trauma. And what you just said there made me realize that they need to have, especially when they're younger, several metacognitive moments so that they can learn. Because what happens is the students have an exam and they're either frustrated or they're happy, but they don't actually stop and reflect on how did I feel during the exam? What might I have done in the exam that made me not finish it, for example? Like, you know, those people who always don't finish an exam because they got stuck on a question or like, the fact that they keep doing that means they're not learning from that mistake. And actually, I don't think anyone ever, I was not that person, but I don't think anyone ever taught them not to do that. And so that self-reflection, not even with your guidance, just them sitting down and reflecting and seeing how did I feel, how did it go for me, in itself, I think, is very valuable. And I've actually got uh, one of the resources we're adding to the site soon is about metacognition. Um, if I could just jump in about that, I had mentioned in the chat, Laura Ritchie, who I think some of you might know, has a new book coming out on self-efficacy, and a huge part of that book is very practical advice for self-reflection, self-assessment for learners outside of school, all kinds of informal learning, so keep an eye out for that. It's going to be called Yes, You Can, Self-Efficacy, something, something, and it's coming out January 10th, and um, I think it's going to be really helpful for people who want something to expand their repertoire of skills they can teach their students, but also just something that students would enjoy reading. It's, um, I got an advanced copy and it's really personable and friendly and, and encouraging in every way. Thank you for that, Laura. And uh, I love Laura Ritchie and her work. And she's a music teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Music professor. So this, was, this will be very interesting. And I imagine in the context of music, this makes a huge difference, the self-efficacy thing, but obviously it has value everywhere. And I always think about higher education as a space for promoting self-efficacy. And I think self-grading or these kinds of grading are promoting self-efficacy because you learn to assess yourself. You learn to manage your own performance in a class whereas versus having something that ha happens to you. You know how we always tell students you didn't get a grade, you earned a grade. But when we're the ones giving them the grade every time, that's not really, it doesn't feel like they're earning it. It feels like we're giving it. And it's pretty arbitrary. Um, Jasmina said something really important. She says that some grading contracts that she's seen talk about if you fail to hand in X, your grade will plummet to C. And she's talking about that kind of negative wording. And that's, I think, also really important. And I think, yeah, if, if someone's trying to do ungrading, but they don't fully internalize the, the why of doing it, you know, why are we doing, what are we trying to develop in students in terms of this self-efficacy and why are we doing it in terms of social justice, then they might make mistakes like that. So that's really helpful with Mina. And I will link to some work of Asawi Noy that um, inspired Arlie and Jesse Stommels, which has inspired, inspired all of us. Um, and I also wanna say when I talk about ungrading with my students, I give them an article by a Palestinian mathematics educator called Munir Fesha, who talks about how grading humans is degrading. Um, and so they read that article and they hear him talk about how grading is such a failure of mathematics, like it's such a misuse of mathematics. So it's really interesting that a mathematics professor would say that. Um, and then I also give them an article by Alfie Cohn, who also speaks really nicely about this, but he's in the K-12 uh, field, right? Um, there's a lot of people in K-12 who do this, which, where you would think they have less freedom than we do as college professors, but apparently there's a lot of them who do that. Um, and 
I have experienced this kind of negative feedback from students when I do on grading and getting in my teaching evaluations. There's a question about the clarity of the grading criteria. <laughs> and so there will be a couple of people who are like, no, there is no clarity in the grading criteria. Uh, it's not that it's unclear, it's just that I'm not the one putting, you know? <laughs> so when we when when they do their self-grading, I've, I've changed it over time. It used to be an open thing and then it became a more structured thing. Like, look at what you've been doing. In the, I do it twice, I do it in the middle and then in the end because I have to give them a mid-semester grade, which Jasmina also has to do, but I don't wanna count up and add up the grades. And it's really hard for them to understand. Don't worry that you lost a mark on this assignment. It's just telling you, this is feedback to you that you could have done better and this is what you should have done better. But don't worry about adding everything up. What matters is your performance towards the end. Because I always feel like whatever that number ends up is arbitrary. And I want to tell that person, actually, you've been performing well. That number is not representing who you are as a, as a person, as a participant in this class. Um, and so in the middle, they, they say what grade they think they deserve based on different things that they've been doing in the class. So just reminding them of what this class is about and asking them to say, what would what does it mean to do well in this class? They say what that is, and I also give them some things to check. Um, but then also, what grade do you aspire to? In the middle of the semester, they're really, really honest. They know where they are, but they want to show me what they're aspiring to and how they want to get there. So they talk about what do they think they could do and what can I do to help them get to their aspirational grade? And then I talk to each of them individually. Sometimes it's just a text message because I agree with them. It's not a big deal. But if they need to discuss it because we disagree on how well they're doing, then we have that. Towards the end of the semester, there really isn't usually a lot of time to discuss it with them. What I end up getting is guys who overrate themselves and girls who underrate themselves. This is the gender dynamic that I usually have. Um, and I try not to make a huge difference. And occasionally I will bump someone up because they really deserve, they give themselves a, a B plus and they deserve an A minus. Or, and I'm saying they deserve an A minus and this is not a number. <laughs> This is, you know, we talked about what does a grade even mean? Is it like against the standard? Is it against other people? Or is it about your effort? And it, none of these things is fair on its own. So it's a sort of a combination of looking at all of that together. Um, and then there, there is, I did also get a complaint once from a student. It's like, okay, count up my grades and tell me how I got a B plus. And I wonder also how people grade participation because I use that as my way, if somebody wants to add things up, then participation grade is really, a lot of it is up to me. Like no matter how you make explicit, how you grade participation, if you make it too explicit, then it's too, if it's too explicit, it's too prescriptive. That's what I was saying about how nice it is to teach online because everything gets objectified and that can actually be a good thing. You know, participation mm -hmm. is a digital thing that happens since I teach asynchronously and we don't have sort of free form discussion. And so that's been a big help for me that students really see how much time effort they're putting into the class. And um, it's, it's easy to see that online in a way that's different from a classroom, I think. Yeah, I mean, in the classroom, you're either sitting there instead of listening to students and marking people off as having participated. Like, I don't know how people actually do it. I have these weird professors who say, oh, there's randomly three classes in the semester. I'm going to grade your participation. That doesn't make sense to me. I learn my students' names like within the first week when we're face to face so that I can keep track of how well they're doing in general. But I can't just sit there and mark it off. I don't know how to do that. In, a, in an online class, you could record it and go back and see and <laughs> stuff like that. And you can't mistake their names because their names are right there. But my students have their cameras off and Zoom doesn't record the people whose cameras are off. It's really odd that way. Like, I don't know why it does that. So Arlie, you wanted to say something, right? Yeah, I mean, I my feeling is that participation is really that, like I see it and how I try to explain to my students is that you're going to be completing this lesson or you know you're going to come to class that is giving you the skills that will you're going to be tinkering with those skills in the participation so i've always done it if you show up 
um, you get the uh, get the point. So when I teach face to face, they usually do some sort of in class activity. They all put their names on it and hand it in. And often I find participation is really that place where we can work on that collaborative writing um, because of the way that I teach my uh, the, the course outline that I teach to, I have to only assign individual grades. There's no group um, component. Um, so I put students when I teach online into pods and the pod, they do their participation activities in the pod. So they can do it asynchronously, but it makes it so that, um, you know, if I have a busy week, I've got three midterms this week, my pod members can kind of pick up the slack. If I, if they How have a big is the pod. So the pod is like a group of buddies that support yeah, each other throughout the semester. Four to five, four to five four to students. Five. Um, and you pick them or? I give them, um, so I try to group them by major so that there's a chance that they've been in other classes with each other. Um, and I do give them input into, you know, if they have friends or, or um, whatever that they can, uh, they can be in those pods. So, I mean, the, my participation is simply, if you do it, you get the points. And so as long as the group has done the participation activity, then kind of everyone gets the points. And I have, um, because we're again, learning about uh, business communication, twice a semester they are the pod leader and so their their job that week is to check in with everyone see how people are doing and then at the end of that week they write me a really short template that's like a, a report that's like what did your group work on um do you have any things that you want me to clarify what else do i need to know and so that gives me a chance of like if somebody's really not responding to their group i can say oh okay well i can check in with, with that person so um I love this so much i'm stealing it this should be a separate video about just that process it's been really nice like i i um i it's been always interesting to read the reflections at the end because often they develop community in ways that i don't expect not all of them some groups sort of uh you know don't gel as as much but there's ones where uh, i had one group that they all met when we were out of lockdown they all met in the park one week and um, you know, they have WhatsApp groups and I still notice, uh, I do also do a blogging project and I've noticed that a few students have kept their blogs going and you can see other students from the class still commenting. Uh, um, one has like an Instagram um, blog. So it's really cool to see that community last um, beyond the, uh, you know, the, the confines of, uh, of the class. But I also think the last thing I wanted to say also is I feel like sometimes participation is an accessibility issue as well, that I do have students who um, I, I don't grade for like, if you talk or make a comment, then you, um, you get the points because I found that, that there's some students who um, just need longer to think about something or who have social anxiety or, um, so I've tried really hard to think about sort of the accessibility and the inclusion aspect of participation. So that like, what does participation look like? You know, if I, um, how can I make it so that students who have a different process or, you know, who, uh, um, you know, have uh, just need extra time or, or um, you know, maybe don't uh, feel comfortable or feel isolated or whatever, um, how can I give credit for what the work that they're doing? That's a great point about accessibility. Arlie, thank you for mentioning that as well. Um, and Jasmina seems to be doing something like similar to your pods and she says she lets students select their group members for the semester about four for a group and she's gamified all her courses so students need to team up for the battles. Um, so she there are several videos I've done with Jasmina where she does different activities room 101 collaborative literature review collaborative storytelling and things like that, so I guess that's the kinds of things they do together because they're learning writing so I guess eventually I try it on their own. But they have all these little quests, I guess, or things that they do together so that's really cool. I'm definitely going to steal this one. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the, because my course is also in the core curriculum, like a gen ed type of thing. So I'm not really sure. They need time to get to know each other so that they can select their own group members. So I'll think through that part. Jonathan, you want to say something? Can, can I just ask a question? I, um, I'm interested in the tension between what Rissa and Laura were saying, were, I, I guess. I mean, I like, I, I, mean, I, I teach math. And so I'm in a STEM area and I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm afraid that I will have many of the same issues that Rissa has in, in chemistry, but I really like Laura's approach of kind of completion based um, check mark kind of thing. I was wondering, could Rissa, could you, I mean, I just can't imagine, is there an issue in, I mean, in STEM like this, sometimes in, like I discovered when I first started teaching, you can't put interesting problems on tests because interesting problems, what are interesting to me are ones that have lots of intricate development and start somewhere and go on a long path. 
And mm -hmm. students, if they get off, if they get off the path early on, they're they're in trouble. So I was wondering if Laura's approach of having there being sort of yes, you've done this and this is something that requires tasks to be very kind of subdividable and independently achievable. Is that is that what you think, Rissa? Is that what you think is a difficulty with that kind of approach in STEM fields? Um, are yeah. Yeah. No, it's a it's an excellent question, and and I love the math structure. But when I taught statistics, I really didn't abide by the learning objectives as much as I should have, right? Because I was asking about like data ethics and like, let's learn how to consume statistics as opposed to Me too. Yeah. remotely <laughs> calculate them with algorithms. That just seems like a waste of time. So um, I'm not real conventional on this stuff. I like asking the big questions and that's why I give take home exams. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I like giving the multi part, like build on questions. You screwed up this part. Suddenly you have, you know, all of these pieces that we have to recalculate and give you points for because I'm not going to take off every time because you missed one part. Um, but Laura's approach, I don't know I, what would. I love Laura's approach. I think Laura's approach is awesome. And I'm saying this to you, Laura, because it's amazing. And I heard about it right after I learned, after I started teaching, actually. I went to the Langford seminar and that's what they were all about. They were all like, yeah, do binary grading, do a whole bunch of moments. And we all looked at it and we were like, there's no way we can do that. And, and it comes down to that problem of asking how many, how many assignments are too many? I guess is my problem. Um, if I make them do as many assignments as would be okay for a medical school to be like, yes, they understand the material. Um, and medical schools are very about, you know, I mean, you know this, right? These medical schools are very exam based. And so we're not really, until they stop being so anal retentive about us being gateway courses for them to be for people to be able to get into their programs and they just are willing to take as many applicants as possible and analyze them we have this problem where medical schools who are like project-based or problem-based don't let us do the same things that they themselves do and so that's that's my issue is that I love Laura's approach. I would love to put into action Laura's approach. I would have to give like 70 assignments throughout the semester. And I feel like that's a time issue. Yeah. I'm now not, I'm undermining my own social justice issues by requiring them to do so much work in another way. That's a really useful point because yeah, yeah it, it's pretty complex to apply all the dimensions of this. And I think you need to look at your own context and decide you know, when would it be risky for your students to do something like that? When would it be problematic? Laura, do you want to say one last thing before we wrap up? Does anyone, if anyone else wants to say one last thing, I'll just give you a minute to do that. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll just chime in about time and the amount of time we ask students to spend. So I think that's just as important as the number of assignments. And I'm really lucky that teaching reading and writing, which is basically what I do, time is a great unit of measure. But I think for other things in STEM and math, some things come really quickly to some students and some things go more slowly and that becomes a justice issue. Whereas with reading and writing, I ask all my students to give me five or six hours. They progress at different rates, but that time is a good unit of measure and, and, and I work with that and I know that's hard to do in other disciplines. It's really interesting because I would think that reading and writing is one of the things where a lot of people get, would have very different speeds, and especially because I teach non-native students. So. Oh very yes, different students, but they all benefit from the time they spend so i'm not telling them how much they need to read or how much they need to to write but i'm confident in the process if everyone gives me five or six hours every week they will make progress and they will be happy with their progress and i'm so confident in that process that i just overwhelm them with that confidence because it's really true but in math and science i'm not sure i could be as confident in promising people that they will experience that progress if they give me five or six hours a week I, i'm not sure but with reading and writing i'm really confident about that, that it's, it's, it really has to do with the standards that we require in stem that we have these arbitrary standards that you have to meet this, 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 and this. And so we don't, we can't measure growth as much as we're hitting, saying you're hitting the standard. And that's really a huge problem in STEM. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't know how to fix it. That's another video. <laughs> okay, and with that, I'm going to wrap up the recording of this, but I'm going to, we're going to hang out a little bit after if you want.